Mackenzie. Hello, Sergeant. What are you up to now, then? Hmm? Well, I'm just having a look at this this new bayonet that we've been issued with the magazine rifle, and comparing it to the old one here. And it it just it doesn't look like much, does it? I mean, it's short, stubby, and well, it, it, I don't know. It's uh. well, I can assure you, it's good for something. Tell me, does your bayonet have an edge? Well, yes, it has two edges, in fact. Are they sharp? I, I don't know. I haven't really. Ooh. Yeah, it's it's good and sharp. Yes, yes, Sergeant. I can assure you, they're good for cutting. Can you guess what? No. That's right. <laughs> uh, right, right away, Sergeant. Right away. The 1890s saw the issue of the service's first magazine rifle, what eventually would be known as the Mark I Magazine Lee Metford. This introduced a massive increase in the firepower available to the infantry. As a repeating rifle of small caliber, it gave an advantage not only of increased rate of fire, but also a ballistically superior projectile. The range at which targets could be effectively engaged pushed to near 2,000 yards in the case of a massed enemy. Despite this substantial leap in capability, the other end of the engagement range still remained important, for conditions, ground, weather, and battlefield circumstances still provided for opportunities to engage at close quarters with the bayonet. While actions of massed close-quarter engagement, particularly involving cavalry, such as happened at Waterloo, were generally over, the bayonet remained integral to the ethos of the infantry. The ultimate goal of seizing and holding ground would still require men to close with their enemy. Famous actions such as the assault of the Gordons and Gurkhas at Dargai on the northwest frontier in 1897, and the attack on the Zariba at the Atbara in 1898 in the Sudan, are clear examples of the necessity of clearing an objective at the point of the bayonet, despite the superior firepower afforded by the powerful magazine rifle. In South Africa, the British and Empire armies met a completely different enemy, who were equipped with similar, and in many cases, superior weapons. This, of course, were the Boers. The Boers famously rarely held on to ground until the bitter end, and therefore examples of close combat, face to face, at the point of the bayonet during the South Africa War, are comparatively rare. They did happen, and when they did, more often than not, the British were able to carry the position. Despite the apparent superiority of the new magazine rifles, in the 1890s, training with the bayonet seemed to have developed. If one looks at the documentation from the 1870s and 80s, bayonet training at its basic level was formal and somewhat stylized. As we move into the 1890s, the basic information provided in the rifle exercises expands greatly. Not only do the techniques change to a degree, but also the exercise becomes much more comprehensive with accompanying exercises, drills, and sparring schemes. To some, this may be seen as somewhat of a paradox, as with the rise of more powerful rifles and even machine guns, the weapon that would academically be in a steep decline received better and more comprehensive treatment. Now it must be understood that despite the apparent inclusion of more comprehensive training, maybe even a more realistic system of bayonet fighting, this was still the 1890s, and the army still relied on teaching the movements in a drill-style environment. Bayonets by numbers was still very much in evidence. In this video, we'll explore the bayonet exercise of the 1890s, as was practiced on the eve of the Boer War. The reference used for this video is the 1898 bayonet exercise, although the 1896 version is identical for the purposes of this video. Now, the late Victorian era was full of examples of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Tel El Kabir, Abu Clay, Works Drift are but three examples of a great many actions that came to blows face to face. The firepower developed by the Martini Henry was considerable, but when confronted with massed enemy at extremely close range, breech loaders of any type simply could not be relied upon to carry the day without the security of the bayonet 
and men who could use it. The advent of the magazine rifle reduced these circumstances considerably. Still, in the twilight of the Victorian age, the bayonet was the last resort in defense, and perhaps more importantly, was the spirit of the attack. Yes, firepower could achieve victory of sorts, and this was proved time and time again, but eventually the infantry had to leave their positions and advance, to capture a hill, or take a fort, clear trenches, or assault an artillery position. In all these activities, the bayonet would provide confidence to its user, intimidation to any who faced it, and, in relatively rare circumstances, the final word in the task at hand. Closing with the bayonet was, and still arguably is, the goal of the exercise. While the instances of its actual use against an undefeated enemy remained comparatively rare, it provided the late Victorian infantryman with a weapon that most importantly gave a psychological benefit to himself, while acting as a psychological deterrent to his enemy. The bayonet exercise of the late 1890s was made up for instructional purposes of a number of core movements and positions. These were what was known as the engage, which was a position of readiness as it were, a series of points or attacks, and a series of guards or parries. Of note regarding the latter, guards had, in the decades previous, been positions from which to engage or defend from, alternate versions of the engage, as it were, high guard and the low guard being two examples focused on opponents higher or lower than the attacker. In the 1890s, guards became movements rather than positions, parries in effect, intended to be used to counter an opponent's attack in one shape or another. An interesting and significant change of terminology. At a basic instructional level, these guards and points were taught formally by numbers, usually on the parade square. Building gradually in complexity, these basic movements could be combined and various sparring and review exercises were prescribed. Many of these are outside the scope of this video, but suffice it to say, they combine to form a face-to-face -face structured environment in which to become confident in the use of the bayonet. The issue of the magazine Lee Metford brought about the end of another era, that of the socket bayonet. Devised in the very late 17th and early 18th centuries, the socket bayonet had transformed the military firearm, combining the function of both pike and musket. Nearly 200 years later, it would finally be supplanted by a generally issued, hilted, knife-style bayonet. Now, sword bayonets had been issued as far back as the early 1800s for certain weapons and personnel. But the 1888 pattern bayonet would be the first to be issued universally. The 1888 bayonet would survive through three patterns, all generally similar, though differing in some minor details. The blade was 12 inches long and double-edged. The hilt featured a conventional arrangement of ring and catch, between which there was a two-piece wooden hand grip. The scabbard was also conventional in its construction of leather with metal hardware, and was carried in a buff leather frog. This pattern of bayonet would be issued with all the Magazine Lee Metfords and Magazine Lee Enfields. The combination of bayonet and rifle gave lesser reach than had the Martini Henry with its 1876 bayonet but this can of course be seen as a satisfactory compromise when tempered with the massive increase in firepower afforded by the magazine rifle. Indeed, one of the primary reasons of the longer bayonet and rifle combination had been for the defense against cavalry. But by the mid-1890s, the use of the square to resist cavalry had generally been supplanted by the understanding that infantry could defeat cavalry by fire alone. For bayonet exercise, prepare! March! These simple commands cued the soldiers on parade to adopt a formation that was suitable for wielding the bayonet and not injuring their neighbor. A squad or company in two ranks would then separate, forming in fact four ranks, with a large interval between men. The instruction or practice could then begin. The engage. Engage! Two! Three! In the first part, the rifle was brought to the position of charge bayonets. 
as noted in the manual exercise of the era, the rifle was thrown up, caught at the right side. Then the body twisted 45 degrees to the right. This brought the right foot to face to the right, while the left pointed to the front. In the second part, the right foot was drawn back approximately 18 inches, and the body was balanced between them. The heels were kept in line. And in the third part, the left foot was drawn up and beat smartly on the ground. There were two alternate positions for the engage. For the engagement of a mounted man, the rifle and eyes were held up towards the threat posed by lance or sword. If confronted by a man with a sword, the rifle was lowered so that the bayonet was approximately at knee level. Points by numbers! The first point. First point! Two. In the first part, without changing the grip of the hands, the rifle was thrust out to the fullest extent of the left arm, nominally aimed at the breast, although period photographs and documentation seem to indicate a rather more parallel-to-the-ground position. Simultaneous to this, without changing the position of the feet, the body was rocked forward, shifting the weight onto the left foot. The right leg was straightened. In the second part, the rifle was brought back to the position of the engage. Simultaneous to this, the weight was shifted back, and the lower body reassumed its former position. The second point. Second point! Here, as noted, there was only one part. This entailed the rifle being thrown out to the fullest extent of the right arm. Simultaneous to this, the left hand quit the forehand, and was placed with the palm on the upper part of the left thigh. The upper body was rotated, bringing the right shoulder forward. As the rifle was thrown forward, the right leg was straightened, shifting the weight to the front. Upon the rifle reaching the full extent of the right arm, it was immediately withdrawn back to the engage, and regripped with the left hand. The weight of the body was shifted back to the engage. The third point. Third point. Two. Three. In the first part, the rifle was drawn back to the fullest extent of the right arm. Simultaneous to this, the left hand's grip moved to a position closer to the muzzle, just behind the front sling swivel. In the second part, the rifle was brought to a position identical to that of the first point, the left hand sliding back along the forestock. The right leg was straightened, shifting the weight forward. In the third part, the rifle was withdrawn back to the position of the engage. Simultaneous to this, the weight was shifted to the rear. This was the shortened arms of the 1890s, and allow an enemy to be engaged at extremely close range. Once these basic movements were mastered, a lunge was added to them. With the lunge, points by numbers. With the lunge, first point. Two. In the first part, the rifle was thrust forward in the manner of the first point. Simultaneous to this, the left foot was pushed forward about 18 inches, shifting the weight forward and gaining a better reach. In the second part, both the rifle and the foot were drawn back to the position of the engage. The second point with the lunge. With the lunge, second point. Here, the rifle was thrown out in the manner of the second point. Extra reach was gained by taking a pace forward of 18 inches with the left foot. The third point with the lunge. With the lunge, third point. Two. Three. In the first part, the rifle was drawn back through the left hand to the fullest extent of the right arm. In the second part, the rifle was thrust forward to the position of the first point. Simultaneous to this, the left foot took an 18-inch pace forward. In the third part, the rifle and the left foot were drawn back to the position of the engage. By changing arms, the rifle was brought to the left side. This allowed for a more flexible approach to any bayonet engagement. Change arms. Two. Three. 
In the first part, the rifle was brought to a perpendicular position centered at the front of the body. As the rifle reached the vertical position, the hand grip was changed. Simultaneous to this, the right foot was drawn up to the left and the body oriented to the front. In the second part, the body was rotated to the left and the left foot drawn back. Simultaneous to this, the rifle was brought down to the position of charged bayonets, only held in the opposite hand. In the third part, the right foot was raised and beat down upon the ground. The same principles were observed to bring the rifle back to the original position. Guards by numbers. As mentioned, guards were defensive movements, or parries. The first guard. Guards by number. First guard. Two. In the first part, the rifle was twisted so that the magazine pointed to the right. Simultaneous to this, it was rapidly moved to the outside of the body, thereby diverting an opponent's attack to the right. In the second part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. The second guard. Second guard. Two. In the first part, the rifle was twisted to the left and moved to the left side of the body, diverting an opponent's attack to the left. In the second part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. The third guard. Third guard. Two. In the first part, the rifle was rotated in a counterclockwise fashion so that the bayonet pointed towards the ground. This would divert an opponent's strike falling low on the body to the right. In the second part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. Guards and points by numbers. Here, these two movements were combined, yielding an evolution, which featured a defensive maneuver followed by an immediate counterattack. The first guard with first point. Guards and points by number. First, two, three. In the first part, the aforementioned first guard was performed. This was followed in the second part by delivering the first point without returning to the engage. In the third part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. The second guard with first point. Guards and points by number. Second. Two. Three. In the first part, the aforementioned second guard was delivered. This was followed in the second part by an immediate first point. And in the third part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. The third guard with first point. Guards and points by number. Third. Two. Three. In the first part, the third guard was delivered. In the second, the first point was delivered, although in this instance it was delivered to waist level. In the third part, the rifle was brought back to the engage. These guard and point combinations were then performed with a lunge. Guards and points with a lunge. First, two, three. The second guard with first point and lunge. Second. Two. Three. The third guard with first point and lunge. Third. Two. Three. After changing arms, the entire exercise could be performed by numbers only holding the rifle in the left hand. The commands were identical to those used in the previous half of the exercise, but are omitted here for brevity. A series of basic movements, points, guards, and lunges were combined into what was known as the review exercise. This was a convenient way to practice and demonstrate mastery of the fundamentals. The exercise began on the word engage and was supposed to take no more than 58 seconds. For bayonet exercise, prepare, march. Review exercise in quick time, engage. 
far and away any images of men conducting part or parts of the bayonet exercise that I have uncovered show the men in drill or review order. I have chosen to show this exercise in marching order as would have been used in Highland regiments. While technically supposed to include the use of the white undress jacket, here the full dress doublet and bonnet are worn. Now, I must admit that without many hours spent on the square perfecting the exercise, there were many aspects here left to be desired. Of particular note was the delivery of the second point in all its combinations. There is certainly a technique to be mastered in keeping the rifle parallel to the ground for that split second and then withdrawing it back to the engage. The awkwardness was exacerbated by the use of the left hand after changing arms, and doubly so when the lunge was introduced as will be evident here. After drilling ad nauseum in the day, I'm sure that these minor points would be ironed out. As shown here, the exercise was performed on a single word of command, the remaining movements happening as part of a choreographed routine. Here we can get a rare glimpse of how this review exercise, and by extension, all formal bayonet training, was conducted. This film dates from the late 1890s, and thus predates the Boer War. Men of the Coldstream Guards conduct the review exercise. You can easily follow along through all of the movements, from point to third guard and point with the lunge. Of note is the nearly theatrical way in which the exercise is conducted. The body is raised more than it is brought forward when delivering the various points. Still, a truly remarkable example. After changing arms, the exercise was repeated. Now the prescribed bayonet training did not end with the review exercise. As mentioned at the beginning of the video, there were a series of simple sparring exercises prescribed in the manual. These involved the two ranks of a company or squad facing each other, each conducting a form of attack while the other defended with a guard. These could also be performed with practice items known as fencing muskets. These had a long sprung plunger built into the end to simulate a bayonet and would recoil when an object or man was struck. In combination with these, masks and body protectors were also used. Now, these exercises are somewhat outside the scope of this video, but perhaps if facilities exist in the future, a more in-depth examination of them can be made. As a final adjunct to this video, mention must be made of some of the eminent fencing instructors of the era. Perhaps most well-known of these was Sir Alfred Hutton. He penned a book specifically for the new Lee Metford rifle in 1890, and it's interesting in the many differences from and the criticism of the army issue version of the bayonet exercise. Hutton purports the use of the butt, both edges of the bayonet, and laments the inclusion of the throw point, or second point as it's known in the exercise. The work exists as an interesting and perhaps more developed system than that found within the exercise. I might make note of some of the kit worn in this video. From the earliest part of Victoria's reign, Highland regiments, for undress purposes, wore a short, waist-length white jacket. By the 1890s, and indeed beforehand, this garment was used for home service only, its use in Dominion service notwithstanding. It was used for routine barrack duties and, in some circumstances, field training. God only knows how they kept them clean. The garments were exclusive to Highland regiments, amongst other Scottish corps, Lowland regiments wearing a scarlet frock for undress purposes. The only other regiments within the army to wear a similar type of garment were the guards, who wore it for the same purposes. Routine duties such as drill or other parades, as well for use on maneuvers or field days. My example closely follows the pattern of the original, and was kindly provided by a friend of the channel, James, of James Dick's Tailoring. If you're in the market for a high-quality reproduction of a Victorian military garment, then James is your man. And thanks to friend of the channel Toby, of the Toby Braley Collection, for providing the bayonet pictures. 
If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.